wisdom You are my true word I ever with you and you with me, Lord You're my great Father and I'm your true Son You dwell inside me together began to go out into the highways and the byways and people were hearing what Jesus would do and what he had been doing and and they went out and people began to hear this and in one such colony one such division within society there was a man 
that courage welled up deep inside of this man when he heard about what Jesus could do and he was able to break through society's crucial conventions and cruel conventions and cast himself at the feet of Jesus Christ. Well, Luke, the physician in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 12, tells us while he was in one of the cities, he being Jesus, while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. You see, the disease had run its course. Now, I'm not a doctor, but from sources that I've read in preparation for today and this story, I've learned that leprosy, or Hansen's disease as we call it these days, isn't a rotting infection, as it's commonly thought. Nor are its horrible outward physical deformities imposed by the disease itself. You see, research has been done by people such as Dr. Paul Brand and others and it's proven that the disfigurement that actually happens because of Hansen's disease or because of the leprosy comes solely because the body's warning system of pain is destroyed, is utterly destroyed. The disease acts as an antiseptic which brings numbness to the extremities as well as to the ears and to the eyes and to the nose. The devastation that follows comes from such incidents as reaching one's hand into a charcoal fire to retrieve a drop bricket, or washing one's face with scalding water, or gripping a tool so tightly that the hands become traumatized and even rather stump-like. Well, the poor man in our story today hadn't been able to feel for years, and his body was full of leprosy. He was mutilated from head to toe, and he was rotten, and he was stinking, and he was repulsive. If he suffered any lapses of reality, all he had to do was raise an infected stump before his browless eyes, and all fantasy would flee. Moreover, the rest of the world was there to remind him of his plight. You see, in Israel, the lot of a poor leper was summed up in Leviticus thirteen forty-five to 46 which says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes, let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone, and his dwelling shall be outside of the camp. What well, we can hardly imagine, friends, the humiliation and the isolation of this leper's life. He was ostracized from society because he, it was thought at that time that leprosy was highly contagious, which it's not. He had to assume a disheveled appearance and cry out once again, unclean, unclean, whenever he came in range of the normal population. Think about how you would feel. Think about how you would feel when you were shouting this, while you entered a grocery store, while you entered a mall, or while you came to work. By Jesus' time, matters were even worse, you see. If a leopard... If a leper even stuck his head inside of a house, it was pronounced unclean. It was illegal even to greet a leper. You see, lepers had to remain at least 100 cubits. You say, what's 100 cubits? 100 cubits is 150 feet away if they were upwind. Well, what if they were downwind? If they were downwind, it had to be 4 cubits, which was 6 feet. There were no illusions in this leper's life. No illusions as to who he was and no illusions to what his condition was. And yet, in Mark chapter 1, we see, Mark chapter 1, verse 40 says, And a leper came to him. A leper came to Jesus. What was he doing? Didn't he know that he wasn't supposed to go by anybody? Well, he was imploring him, and he knelt down in front of him and said, If you will, you can make me clean. Now, this, 
This encounter, my friends, is once again startling. It's provocative. It's even offensive. This man with leprosy, whom the culture considered an outcast, the, jo- the law judged unclean, and the people deemed cursed by God, shouldn't even approach another person. The fact that he came near to Jesus was unthinkable. But here he is. And he's desperate, and he's willing to chance that Jesus has both the power and the grace to heal him. Don't forget, Luke chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, the man came full of leprosy. His whole body was consumed with sores. He was hopeless, for all were powerless to help this man. But somewhere, somehow, he heard about Jesus Christ, and he heard about Jesus' miraculous power. Hope sprung up in his heart, and he began to search for Jesus. When he found out where Jesus was, the leper made his way to Jesus and fell at his feet. This leper. This one that was considered the most unclean of all was so desperate and was so intent on seeking Jesus' help that he forgot everything else and he forgot everybody else that was around. He forgot all about the law requiring him to come no closer than six feet of another person and he forgot all about the thronging crowd that surrounded Jesus. He saw no one and he thought of no one except for Jesus Christ. You see, it was his desperate need, it was his enormous hope that sparked within him because of Jesus, that drove him to race through a crowd and fall on his face and beg for help. This hope rose to worship as he fell down before the Lord and Savior, and the leper saw in Jesus the divine power of God himself. You see, he didn't say, You can ask God, and God will make me clean. He said, if you will, sir. If you are willing, you can make me clean. In other words, if you can do it for others, perhaps you can even do it for me. He was saying that Jesus possessed the power of God himself to cleanse this man. Full of faith, he confessed our first principle for today, that Jesus is the great hope of the most unclean. Once again, Jesus is the great hope of the most unclean. You see, when we look at the leper, friends, we shouldn't just find one that's has a sad story, but what we should see in the leper is we should see a picture of ourselves. For we are all unclean. We are all sinners. We are all in need of the grace of God. Jesus will heal any individual. He will heal any individual from the most feared and the deepest disease of all if we will simply approach him as the leper approached Jesus. But the problem for us is that sin lies to us, my friends. How does sin lie to us? Well, it controls us in two opposite extremes of ways. First, it, it might say to you, well, you know, you are, you, you're a good person. I mean, there's really nothing wrong with you. I mean, have you seen that other person? They say that they believe in Jesus, and, and you've got to be better than them. I mean, they did this, and they did this, and they did this, and they did this. You've got to be better than that person. And how about that person? They don't even know Jesus, but they've got this problem, and this problem, and that problem. So you must be a good person. I mean, Jesus must love you just simply by being a good person. Or the other problem is, sin lies to us in another way. You see, sin says this. Sin says that you're unworthy. Sin says that you are unworthy. We think that we are so bad that nothing and no one can actually help us. We think that we are, once again, so bad that nothing and no one can help us. Or we begin to go, why would Jesus love me? I mean, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. I'm so unworthy of him. Why in the world would he ever let me come? But a leper, the most unclean of all, came before Jesus and placed himself down before Jesus. And at that moment, Jesus said something to him. You see, Christ is sufficient for all. To be accurate, 
the leper did voice some hesitation, as we often do in our own lives, by saying, if you will. See, the issue isn't whether Jesus could heal him, but this man believed that the question rather is, would Jesus heal him? This man comes to Jesus with great courage, with great humility, and with great faith, much the same way that we as sin-sick sinners must come to Jesus. He came believing in the only one who could change his life, the only one that could make him whole. Although we, he knew Christ could heal him, he didn't know whether Christ actually would heal him. But where the leper has hesitation, friends, we can have certainty on the rock of Jesus Christ because we know the gospel and we know Jesus' heart. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, nothing is more in accord with the will of God than this is. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, moving on with our story, it says, Moved with pity. Who was moved with pity? Jesus was moved with pity. And so what did Jesus do? He stretched out his hand and he touched the man and he said to him, I will. Be clean. See, Jesus didn't drive away this man who had broken the law and coming to him in the first place. Once again, the leper had no right to even speak to Jesus at all. But Jesus met the desperation of the human need. The word says he was moved with pity, which brings us to our second principle for today. Jesus was moved with compassion for the most unclean. Jesus was moved with compassion for the most unclean. He felt it in his stomach. Jesus' reaction went beyond pity. It went beyond sympathy. It went beyond empathy. It was gut-wrenching compassion that our Lord and Savior had for this man. So how was Jesus moved with compassion? First, he was moved with compassion by touching the man. Jesus was moved to reach out and touch the man. He didn't ignore this man. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. You see, the Lord delights in touching needy people. Once again, the Lord delights in touching needy people. Jesus didn't push him back. Jesus didn't jump away in fear of catching his disease. He could have, for the man had no right to approach Jesus. But Jesus, knowing the man's heart, was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion and he reached out and he touched the leper. He touched the most unclean of all. In all of his miracles, there was no need for Jesus to really touch anybody. So why did Jesus do it? Because he was naturally moved within himself to reach out to the greatest in need and touch them. Since this man was full of leprosy, we can reasonably assume that he hadn't been touched for years. He hadn't been touched by a soft, healthy hand in years. If he had a wife, he had not known her touch, much less her embrace for many long years. If he had children, there there had been no kiss, there had been no touch, not even once, and now they probably were even adults. Whatever his family status, he must have longed for a human Interaction. Time stood still. As Christ reached out his hand and touched this man. Now we can't attempt to adequately describe the delight that came over this man's body, but the onlookers were shocked and the disciples were shocked. Why did Jesus do this? Well, aside from the reason that we have mentioned, that it was most natural for him, he wanted the leper to feel his willingness to know the sympathy that our Lord had for him. The touch said, I'm with you, I understand, I love you. Those are the human reasons, though. But just go with me just a little deeper today for a moment. There's also an overshadowing theological reason. The touch of Christ's pure hand on the rotting leper is a parable of the Incarnation. 
What in the world does that big word mean? Well, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it tells us, For our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. You see, in the incarnation, Jesus put on flesh within himself. He became sin for us, and he gave us his purity. Jesus laid hold of our flesh. He touched us, and he healed us. Can you see it? Jesus was bent over this prostrate leper, his holy hand resting on the decaying flesh of the foul-smelling leper, and you see what he did for him. Similarly, You can see what has been done and what Jesus wants to do for each one of us. How was Jesus moved with compassion? First, he was moved to touch. Secondly, he was moved to speak. Jesus was moved to speak the most wonderful words that this leprous man had ever heard before in his life. Jesus said that he was willing for the man to be healed, and he commanded that the man be cleansed. In Mark chapter 1, verse 42, And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. The healing was sudden. The healing was complete. His feet, his toeless, ulcerated stubs were suddenly made whole. They were bursting his shrunken down sandals. The knobs on his hands grew fingers before their very eyes. Back came his hair. Back came his eyebrows. Back came his eyelashes. Under his hair were ears, and before him was a nose. His skin was soft upon the touch. Can you hear a thundering roar from the multitude? Can you hear the man crying out, not unclean, unclean, but I'm clean, I'm clean. That is what Jesus Christ can do for each of us. For anyone in an instant, in a split second of belief, the healing of Christ from sin to salvation is instantaneous and it's complete. Again, sin manipulates and lies to us in two different ways. It says, you're a good person. You don't really need Jesus. You're good by yourself. Or number two, it says, you're unworthy. Jesus can never look at you. And both of those are lies because through Jesus Christ and the good news, we can be saved from the manipulation, saved from the deceit, saved from the lies of the enemy and we can receive the good news of Jesus Christ you see all my confidence friends everything I am all that I represent all preaching rests right in this reality he will actually touch your leprosy he will take hold of it even better you will be immediately healed In Mark chapter 1, verses 43 through 45, it says, And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. What is surprising is the stern charge and the way that Jesus quickly exits from the scene. You see, he sends the leper packing with a command to keep his mouth shut. Jesus doesn't want people who merely seek miracles. He wants followers who will seek after him. People are always tempted by the sensational. We want to see Jesus as he touches people. Jesus desires, though, followers who long for truth and want to know who Jesus really is. He doesn't want people to just come to him and get what they want. He wants people to come to him so that they can get him. You see, unlike modern politicians and pop stars whose survival depends on their remaining in the public eye, Jesus doesn't hustle to increase his name recognition. In our day, the miracles might make the headlines for a few weeks, but then interest would probably diminish as people desire something new and something more sensational. Jesus' mission is not to provide little sound bites and fresh sensations for the 11 o'clock news each night. 
He isn't after personal glory that will deflect credit from God. He wants to avoid the adoration of a crowd that is without understanding and a personal commitment. The miracles are of newsworthy and news value. And it's good news to those who are on the receiving end. But it's not the sum total of the good news of Jesus Christ, which also involves both suffering and death and serving on others' behalf. Ironically, Jesus and the leper actually trade places in this story. You see, if you go with me back to the beginning of this story, it said that the leper came. Jesus was in the town, and the leper was outside of town. The leper now is on the inside with family and friends, and Jesus is on the outside in a lonely, desolate place. This picture of substitution is the heart of the gospel, my friends. It's why Jesus came. He will take our sin, he will take our sorrow, and he'll take our shame upon himself. In return, he gives us forgiveness. He gives us his holiness. He gives us his righteousness. Praise the Lord. What an exchange we can have. All because of Jesus. Jesus touches lives and he makes them whole. He did that for me. Has he done that for you? Have you allowed him to do that for you? Believe me, he wants to do it today. On another note, there's a story that Few would make the sacrifice of a man by the name of Father Damien. You see, Father Damien in 1870 went to serve the lepers who were banished on the island of Molokai. He, he lived with the corrupted bodies. He lived with the stench. He lived with the rats and he lived with the flies. And he lived with no running water to fulfill what he said was his priestly duty to let them know that God has not forsaken them. You see, Father Damien actually died as a leper. Having contracted the disease of those he served, the miracles in this section reveal that Jesus isn't someone who is aloof. Jesus is not someone who's inaccessible, And Jesus is not someone who is detached. In our culture, there's people that we don't touch. There's people that we live in isolation from. We seal ourselves off from one another with our privacy fences, and we retreat to our inner sanctum of the family room. You see, the church, though, oftentimes is in the same danger. It's in the danger of doing the same thing by retreating to our members-only, fully equipped family life center, which becomes a safe cocoon from the contact with the harsh realities of a disease-ridden, sin-sick world. You see, so often, the church has wanted others quarantined from us so that they won't infect us. But those who bear the name of Jesus Christ need to minister in the name of their Lord to those who are untouchables in our society. And we must do it in a non-judgmental way. The attitude toward leprosy in biblical times is no different from our attitude toward certain diseases today. You see, some people are afflicted with dis- from illnesses that we assume they have contracted because of some sin that they have committed. Many pronounce them guilty for their supposedly having committed worse sins than their own. And they treat their disease as a curse that sets them adrift from the community and from God's grace. What does this accomplish? This truly, my friends, can only drive people further from the gospel of Jesus Christ and further into their despair. If Jesus is the model for the church's ministry, we see that he never condemns the afflicted. He never tells people that they are sinners. He never says that they have possessed unclean spirits. Instead, we see 
One who is confident in the power of God, who touches the unclean, who restores the banished to their community, and who restores the sick to a meaningful role of service. The touch from Jesus is a sign of acceptance. He doesn't treat people as outcasts or as some kind of pollutant. He is able to heal all fever, especially the fevers of the soul. You know, the burnings within from anger, from resentment, from envy, from feverish lies. In conclusion, there is a relevant application, I believe, from this. You see, my friends, you and I, will never affect others as Christ did unless there's some contact and identification. Some contact with the outside world and some identification that just through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ was I able to be one step further to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, we need to lay our hands. We need to lay our hands on some rotting flesh in our neighborhood. We can't expect this to only be the job of some missionaries that we send overseas because a church that doesn't regularly actually place its hand on people will soon stop sending missionaries as well. I pray that the Lord and Savior would put in us a heart for those all around us. That God would continue to let us see that only by the grace of God are we saved. Only by the grace of God are we one step closer to Jesus than those that are around us. And I pray that the lies of the enemy and the deception that he has given over and over again through the lies of sin, either saying that we're good enough and therefore we don't need Jesus or saying we're unworthy and therefore we can't accept And Jesus would never accept us. I pray that those lies would be squashed in your life. And I pray that we would be a place, once again, where people belong, believe, and become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Let it be so. Let us pray with one another. Heavenly Father, today, in the lives of so many I pray, Lord, that you will break the strongholds of the enemy, that you will break the lies, that we will not think that we are good enough by ourselves, but that we will rest in the arms of God, and that we will not think that we are unworthy and therefore can't come into a relationship because Jesus and God would never accept someone like me. Father, I pray pray in Jesus' name that things and chains would be broken. That we would be a church that would push outside of the doors of this place to begin to see the handiwork of God in the midst of everything. Give us a heart. Give us a heart like yours where we can come into contact with people that may be in the same situation as the one in this story. Let us identify, but let us share the good news of the mercy and the grace of God with each one. We thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your peace and your hope. Now God, let us rest in you once again. In the name of your Son, and our Savior, and our Lord, Jesus Christ, we pray all of these things. Amen and amen. May God continue to bless you, and may you be a blessing to others as well. God bless.
the blood that washed us white, the God who was and is and shall be forevermore. Holy is the Lord. Jesus, Redemption has a name. 